Well, welcome to another edition of Remember When. Joining me <laughs> on this edition is none other than Troy Douglas, a world-renowned sprinter coach now. Um, Troy, we're going to go back to the days uh, when you first started um, running track and field on the grasses of, of the, the, the National Sports Center. Do, do, you remember the, do you remember how you got started? I, I I remember very well how I got started. Um, I was training at the National Training Center, National 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 uh, Training Center, and uh, I just trained because I I did pretty good at, at high school sports, and uh, I was allowed to come train to a national team, thanks to Mr. Clive Long, and I did pretty good. But to be honest, uh, that summer when I was training at track and field, I was also training cricket. And uh, I wanted to make Junior County in the Eastern Counties for Cleveland County. And uh, my best friend was Captain Dennis Rainwright Jr. for Cleveland. And I thought, okay, it's a shoe in for me. But uh, he didn't select me. And that was the biggest disappointment in my sports career. And uh, he says, yeah, but Dougie, you're not good enough, Dougie. <laughs> And I went home crying, and uh, I was crying, 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 but I was disappointed. And my brother Stephen said to me, it's the best advice he's ever given me is, yeah, but Troy, you're in the national selection for track and field. Why don't you go, for, why don't you go pursue your career in track and field? Because you're not damn good at cricket. So I took his advice. And my brother and Dennis just, uh, gave, gave me a career, basically. Yeah. When you look at what challenges we had back then as far as track and field, because we were doing a lot of running on grass. Um, would you say that that gave us a slight edge when it came to running on a track? Because it was it was it gave us extra incentive, gave us extra just just that that push to 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 be a little better. Um, I would take it somewhere further. Um, I, I'm involved in coaching now, uh, not only in track and field but in football. And um, I think we don't give Clive Long enough credit. And what I mean by that is what he brought in as a coach is, is pretty much what is a uh, blueprint for coaching. And the way you coach, the way you look at a, an athlete with, with a certain amount of, um, and I hate this word, so I don't use it that much, uh, with a gift. If an athlete, I don't like the word talent, so I say if an athlete has a quality, uh, uh, he's able to, 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 to coach that quality. And my point is, is that a coach like Clive Long was very, very, very instrumental in developing uh, good athletes with the uh, training style that he had. There's no disrespect to the coaches that we had at that time, but he was so far ahead of his time with the coaching style that he had with the different uh, drills and uh, the, 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 the periodization that he brought to coaching. And I think uh, what we did not realize at that time is we have always had a unique quality of athletes in Bermuda. Uh, we have something in Bermuda that uh, I think we realized it, but we haven't tapped, to, uh, tapped into it to its optimist. Clive Long did is we have athletes who can play cricket, football, track and field. That's for men. We have women who can do softball, netball, track and field. And they do that up until they're 16 years old. And he saw that. And what he did was he was able to uh, uh, get the most out of that individual. I don't care if you played for North Village or PHC or, or Cougars. As long as you're ready to run Carifta, it's okay. You can still go play football. You can still play cricket. You can still go play netball. And that was unique from Clive Long. And uh, so the facilities that we had, we think that it was not optimal, but it was very, very optimal facility. I mean, that facility is the same facility that, that the University of West Indies has in Jamaica that produced Olympic champions. So they also have a, a track, but uh, a big portion of their training is done on grass. So... Uh, it, 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 the facility plays a role, but the person who's actually doing the work also plays a role 
within the facility and also the individuals that we have and we had a we we still do have a good system and we had a good system then when did you feel you had outgrown bermuda sports in order to move stay away compete professionally um because we notice our elites can't be or, or are not local based they have to be in an environment that is a, a little more challenging than <laughs> being in Bermuda. When did you feel it was that time for you to to, to make that move? Um, I made the move in 1984-85 because um, uh, basically the move was really, really seriously made in 1987 after the Pan American Games, after uh, I spent the whole year of 86 in Bermuda training with Nick Saunders. And uh, not only training, we talked a lot. And in our conversations, he kept saying, Dork, 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 you got to make a move. Dork, you got to get put yourself in the environment where uh, you're with other uh, good 400 meter runners, good 200 meter runners. Uh, you could do it on your own here for one year, but you need to go. You need to go and you, you need to uh, uh, put yourself in a position to go further advance if you want to qualify for a major tournament. And so uh, I qualified for Pan American Games and I uh, finally I got picked up by a college and I ended up going to school. And it worked out well for me. So, um, and my whole goal was not to make it. It was to make it to the Olympics, but my goal was, I just wanted to know what did you have to do to get there? Because uh, what you fail to realize, I, I grew up and I trained when guys like Cal Deal and those guys were training for the Olympics. So I watched them, uh, but I could not uh, feel and taste and smell and and touch what they what they went through i could see it but i couldn't feel it and so as a dreamer and i'm the biggest dreamer on the planet uh i i really wanted to experience that for myself so when opportunity presented itself to leave the island and to take that scholarship i took it so that's all i did it for i did it just just to i wanted to see what they experienced i just wanted to feel it for myself and it it led from one thing to another so yeah once you get into that environment um how do you make that adjustment because coming from a place like bermuda like you said you were here training with nikki and, and, and training when you're and stuff but your your your, your mind just gets us get you as far as bermuda now you're in an environment that that sometimes you don't even think you're just gonna do it. So so how, how do you adjust to that? Um, I'm gonna give us Bermudians a big compliment, and we don't do that enough to each other. And the biggest compliment I'm gonna give ourselves is what's unique about our island. And we think that it's small. That size of that island also uh, uh, protects you, and it gives you. Uh, something uh, that other countries can't give you, and that is uh, the village raised a child. And the village, by the village raising the child, and everybody hears that quote, it's an African proverb, but what I take from it is that village made sure that they installed so much pride in you that if you go out there, there's no way in hell. I'm going to let Devils hold on. I'm going to let Cleveland County down. I'm going to let Napton Hill down, or better yet, I'm going to let Bermuda down. I can't, because that is installed in you. So uh, uh, when you go out there, uh, you don't want to go out there with expectations. You go out there being as, um, uh, as a virgin. As a virgin, you allow things to come in, and you can decipher whether it's good or bad. And that's something when the village raises a child, and that's unique what we have in Bermuda, we have that strength within us. That, that, is, that, is, that is, is, is pushed in us. I can come home and I can walk around town and somebody's going to say, Dougie! And uh, that person doesn't realize that uh, uh, that's love for me. You know? That's like, uh, 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 it's like, Dougie, I went to Ajax, man, and you showed me around. That's love for me. You know, and they know that I am a proud comedian. I look out for my people. My people look out for me. And wherever I go, I have to represent my people. And that is something that is installed in us.
So I was I was I wasn't uh, shocked when and and a new situation had I had to adjust to it. So I wasn't shocked. I, I was prepared for it. Would you say you was pre re properly prepared for college life, competing and doing schoolwork at the same time, or or were you just mentally into I want to compete, I want to learn? Because you said it earlier, you wanted to learn what the feeling was like getting to the Olympic, getting to a world championship. Uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, you have to be. What you learn as a student athlete is balance. You have to learn to, uh, uh, I think that's a very good question. <laughs> um, uh, it, 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 it helps an athlete of today and it helps an athlete in my day. Is Although I, I, I was in love with the sport, the sport made me who I am. Uh, another part that made me who I am was I was able to succeed in studying. And during the study and, and being an athlete, I discovered the things that I really loved. Uh, I love to read. Uh, I love anthropology. I love sociology. And uh, I love music. So I was able to uh, choose a curriculum that best suited me. Uh, and I never finished my college. But as a good friend told me, and I give her respect, for, I, I'm really, really thankful for her for telling me this, is that some college is more than, is more than a student who finished college. So <laughs> um, uh, 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 it taught me how to balance the things that I like and choose the things that I like because I have my future in my hands. Um, I can decide what degree I want to take and I can decide how far I want to come as an athlete. And I don't think, uh, I just realized that uh, being a coach in football, that uh, as an 18 year old or a 17 year old, you have so much in your own hands. And uh, by, by, by being in the situation that I'm in now, I'm like, shit, I, I, I made some good choices <laughs> by, by watching the guys and the advice that I'm giving them. So it's, 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 I had a choice and I decided to do what I wanted to do. So that was something that I look forward to. Was there any time early in your career that you were given advice to possibly um, switch to a shorter version? Because I know you like the four um, coming off of <laughs> three bands instead of two. <laughs> two. Yeah. Um, any thought, anybody try to give you advice because of, because of your build, because of your stature? I mean, you had a lot of power, so running the two and the one at the time and you were coming through, the guys that had all the power were doing the shorter versions, but you seem to want to challenge yourself to do e even even bigger and, and better things. Yeah, I, 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 I wasn't good enough at the 100 at that time, uh, to be honest, and I tell people this all the time. I wasn't even, I was, I was number eight in my time in Bermuda. I was in the top eight best, one and two guys. Um, I ended up being in the top four in the 400. Uh, I happened to blossom in the 400. Um, and I would go back to what uh, Clive Long did was, uh, he said one thing to me. He says, you got the, a guy with your ability, you're going to have to be able to do all three. When you do all three, um, uh, any university or any junior college would love to have you because you're versatile. So that versatility uh, um, uh, felt, it, it, it fit me perfect, particularly for the kind of person I was because I can uh, uh, go to the 100 or 200 or 400. Uh, but when it came down to actually making a career, I had more success at the 400 at the Olympics than I had at the 200. And uh and when I made the decision to stop the 400 and go to the 200, to the 100 and 200, it was because of uh, when I changed countries and my coach asked me, um, what's your best in the 100? And I told him and he said, you mean you never worked on it? I said, well, I thought I worked on it. He says, no, you never worked on it. So we took it as a challenge for ourselves. And I ended up running 10.09. I mean, I didn't expect that. I was just happy to run 10.2, 10.1. But when I started running 10-1 and 10-2 every day and 10-0, I was like, okay, I'm pretty good. But uh, the challenge was he taught me 
uh, how to uh, run the 100. And uh, a lot of it was, was physical, but I think the last phase of it was more mental than anything. When, when, you, finish, when you finish a college career and, and you're going on and, and now you're becoming professional, you're getting, you're, you're getting all these different challenges and, and different um, um, opportunities to compete, when when does it when does it kick in that you have arrived because <laughs> you're traveling all over to 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 make a living? It, it, yeah, it, it's it's a job, but in in your eyes as a youngster, it's I'm running track. When 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 does it kick in? It kicks in. Uh... <laughs> have you talked to Belman yet? Y y yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna probably say something that Velma didn't say. Have you talked to Nikki yet? Not yet. Okay, for me, it kicked in when I saw, uh, after running for three months, I saw $10,000 and I'm like, Are you serious? This is mine? $10,000? This is mine? I'm like, this is it. And for me back then, it was a lot of money. Earl. Yeah. But I'm like, 10,000 cash. I'm like, wow, that's a lot of money. So I can pay this year and then I can go run the second half and that's all mine. And so that's when it changed. For me. And uh, yes, it is the root of all evil, but it, all, it could also be the root of all evil, but it also could uh, make you look at yourself differently. <laughs> because well now change is a focus because now you're not just running you're chasing the money aren't you i wasn't chasing the money um uh i'm very if i look at the athletes today i'm very fortunate to come along at the time i came along um uh when you talk to nikki or brian uh i was a sprinter so i was fortunate in my time to have a b race in the 100, 200, or 400. So I could always make money. And I would go back to what Clive Long said, make sure that you're versatile. So I was so versatile that my manager can get me to any race. And whether it was an A race or a B race, I can make my living. Uh, that is something that uh, a lot of athletes don't understand. They do understand, but it's hard. And uh, you, you, you need coaching in, in it. And uh, a lot of guys want to specialize and want to be that guy on the A-list in Zurich. Uh, Zurich doesn't have an A-list. Zurich only has one A-list and they're only taking the top eight in the world. The rest of you guys, you have to go figure it out in some small meet in Belgium or in Germany because Zurich is not going to pay for another eight guys to run a race. Whereas in my time, Zurich paid to have an A race, a B race, and a C race. And I was happy to be in the B race because I knew I was getting paid. If you got in the C race, you wouldn't get nothing. And I got in the B race, I'm like, okay, at least I can get $1,000 today. Yeah. So that was different than what it is today. So, um, uh, yeah, that was that was a different motive. My, my motivation really wasn't the money. My motivation, like I said early on, was really, I just wanted to experience it. Um, it was unique to be uh, on the traveling circus. I don't know what Belmont called it, but I call it the traveling circus. And uh, uh, you're, you're on the airplane, uh, you're on a train, you're on a bus, you're in a, the fanciest Mercedes Benz back then, and you're just going through Europe. And uh, this is before 9-11, this is before, this is like between 1987 and 1999, 2000. Uh, where the, 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 the checking in and out of an airplane was like checking in and out of a bus. I mean, you could come to the airport 20 minutes before the flight, walk on the flight, and boom, you're in Italy. Uh, uh, 20 minutes, boom, you're in, 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 in Spain. That's how it was for us. So we, 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 we literally were a traveling circus. I remember one time uh, we ran a meet in Austria, and uh, the meeting organizer from Paris uh, 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 rented the high-speed train, first class, for everybody that ran in Austria to take us to Paris uh, or, 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 or 
the meeting organizer in Lausanne rented the high speed train from Paris to take us to Lausanne. So uh, it, it literally, literally was a traveling circus where you got to see and experience things that uh, most of most average people who hear this would say, "Well, I got, I have to, I do, that's my vacation, but that's our job." So uh, yeah, it it was unique. I mean, it's very, very unique. Yeah. When, yeah. when making the decision to change countries, how much of a challenge was it for you to decide? I know you wanted to extend your career and, and living there at the time would have made would have made it a little easier. But as as you're deciding that, um, what goes through one's your thought process? <laughs> I didn't want to. Um, to be honest, I wanted to stop in '96, and. Uh, my coach and Merlin Otti told me, yeah, but you look so good. Why don't you try one more year? So I decided to try one more year. And that uh, one year I decided to try was the same year the national relay coach from the Netherlands kept bugging me. I, I decided to take it easy in 97 and uh, relax and to see what I want to do in 98. And I was running, uh, I decided not to do much big meets. I wanted to do small meets in, in Belgium and in the Netherlands and Germany. Uh, it's close to home. I liked living in Europe. I want to see what my experience would be like living in Europe for another couple of years. And But the national coach kept bugging me and he kept inviting me to, to come run a competition. And I said, you know what, I'm going to run one race for you. And I jumped in, I ran the relay for him, and uh, they ran a national, we ran a national racket, but it was not uh, accredited because of me, because I wasn't a Dutch citizen. And he said, see, Troy, you can make a difference for us. And uh, he kept bugging and bugging and bugging, and I was like, okay, I'll do it. And uh, I did it. Uh, I, I thought about my future. Um, I knew... Uh, I had a future in Bermuda, but I had a better future here because I was already working here and I uh, was already in the in the system and everything was going well and I felt comfortable. So it was a, uh, it was uh, emotional. It was difficult. I remember being in Athens talking to Judy Simons about it and uh, I asked her for her advice and uh, we talked about it um, on a professional and personal level. And uh, she could look into my eyes and see that, yeah, but Troy, um, I know you have a huge love and passion for Bermuda, but I have the feeling that there's something there that you want to go for. And I was like, yeah, I do. I do want to see what it's like on the other side of the coin. So I, 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 I took the opportunity. And uh, do I regret it? No, I don't regret it. I mean, sometimes things happen to you in your life where people say things to you that, that hurt you a little bit. But that's because of these decisions you make. So uh, you have to learn to uh, grow with it and grow with the punches. So um, I'm happy with the decision I made. Um, looking back and looking for, forward in the decision that I made now, it was a good decision. So yeah, it was tough, but it was good. When you when you decide that you're going to make that move and, and you join this relay team and, and you guys are your timing is down, you're, you're working at it and all. Did you, did you, because you said you, you uh, had that chat with, uh, with Judy Simons, the president of the Bermuda Olympic Association, you wanted to see what it was like on the other side. Did it meet your expectations? Uh, a good question, Earl. Um, I don't think it had to meet my expectations. I had to meet my expectations. And what I mean by that, what I learned uh, by making that move was that, um, and I see it a lot happening now, and I might be pretty critical about it because of my own experience, was I did I, I, I had a little expectation that they were going to do more for me, but a country like the Netherlands is like, no, you made this decision, uh, we give you the opportunity, but you're going to have to make the step. And what I mean by that is uh, you have to take responsibility for your decision. And by taking responsibility for your decision is realizing that uh, you're going to be sitting on the fence a lot. But uh, if you complain, think before you complain because you made the decision. 
And uh, the over people are always going to say, I never asked you to be a professional athlete. I don't mind you coming up for the country, but I never asked you to be a professional athlete. That's your choice. And that's the point I want to make. I made the choice to be a professional athlete. Change countries is a different thing. And when you change countries, you're, you're still a professional athlete. So the things that come with being a professional, you have to accept certain things because it's never going to be a handout. You have to earn everything you get. And that's something uh, that I've always had a problem with, uh, with, 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 but I, I understood it by being in it. And once I became a coach and I had to deal with athletes like that, I said to realize that, listen, you made the decision, not me. Yeah, you have to take your responsibility. Don't think that Bermuda owns you something. Bermuda doesn't owe you a damn thing. Okay? Thank you. Be thankful for that passport. Yeah? And that's the way I learned here. And that's the way it made me a better professional and a better person. Because I was able, uh, what unique is here in the Netherlands is, uh, Bermuda does the same thing, but particularly here in the Netherlands is, if you're good and you get an interview, uh, like we're doing now, it's up to you how you portray yourself and put an image of you out there that's going to be able for you to be successful. Yeah? And you don't have to make it up. If you're yourself, you're yourself. Somebody sees it, somebody believes in it, and you, that's where you get your start because they allow you, they give you that uh, vehicle. I was unique. Uh, whereas after every race, I had like 10 journalists, so I was able to put myself out there to make myself accessible, to set myself up to where I am today. So that's the difference I had. It's not about trying to sell a show or sell anything. It's, it's just giving the people who I am and uh, uh, showing that, yeah, anything is possible if you put your right mind to it. I don't want any kid to take my blueprint I just want a kid to take a person. You don't have to be a, a kid. You can be an you can be an adult. I just want you to take uh, uh, my experience as an example. It may not work for you, but at least you know. Hey, there is an example, and uh, I know what to do and what not to do. Yeah. When, when did coaching come to mind for you? <laughs> it happened as an accident. <laughs> I figured it would. I figured it would. That's why I asked. It, it happened as an accident. Um, I was training in Amsterdam, and uh, I was live. I live in The Hague. I've always lived in The Hague. I, I never wanted to live in Amsterdam. Um, I love Amsterdam, but I never want to live there. And uh, they were looking for a sprint coach, and uh, they came to me, and I was like, "All right, I'll do it." And uh, it was it, it paid very well back in that time, and it, it paid very well. I'm like, geez, you pay this must be a coach two nights a week. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I'm like, shit. So I started coaching, and um, um, and I'll forget the first training session I had. I I, I was stressing, man. And uh, I had an idea in my head, so I wrote down this beautiful program. And I was still running at that time. And I started coaching here in 1996. And I took my training program to Hank that morning because I had to train that day. And I said, Hank, I'm going to coach tonight. And this is the program. He looked at it. <laughs> and he said, ooh, wow, this looks pretty. <laughs> and I was like, yes, 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 I'm going somewhere. And he asked me one question that actually made me a better coach. And he says, so how are you gonna make it work? I'm like, what do you mean? He says, this looks good today, but these kids have to be ready in July. And I was like, oh yeah, oh yeah. So basically what I started doing was, uh, I always had a blueprint in my head, but I would always, uh, uh, talk with Hank about different things and to, so that when I went to practice, I looked at coaching differently. And I must say, when I started coaching and I was still running, 
it made me look at my coaching diff- made me look at Hank differently. So I had a luxury problem because uh, he was still coaching, not only coaching, but he was given lots of lectures. And I would go with him a lot to the lectures. So I, uh, uh, my brother Stephen keeps telling me all the time, he says, Troy, what you feel to realize is you got a university degree without realize, without even going to university. You got a university degree by, going, by having Hank as your coach but also going to all the lectures with Hank and being a guinea pig for all the experiments and then coaching for yourself. And I didn't realize that until I talked to my brother. I told my brother, you asked me this question, my brother asked me this question. And I was like, shit, I never realized that until I actually had to explain to him. And so, yeah, this sounds like one of my brother's damn questions. Um, <laughs> uh, no, it was easy for me because like I said, I, was, um, I had Hank as a coach. And at the same time, my training partner was working at the tennis academy. So the two of us were in the middle of starting our coaching careers. So during the breaks of our runs, we would talk about different things in training. So we did not realize the things we talked about would be the blueprint for the jobs that we have now. We did not realize that. So it was something that I did. I knew I was preparing for it. Like I said, I always wanted to experienced that but I actually lived the experience and didn't uh I forgot to 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 wake up sometimes if you understand what I mean I was so much in the experience that I forgot to wake up and and realize that I was in the experience yeah previous years we used to hear a lot about um especially track and field um individuals pushing one another and training together and, and 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 the groups you had the luxury of, of being um, one of, of the trio with Nikki and, and Ryan Wellman. And you guys kind of pushed yourselves to a limit here <laughs> that, that also uh, revealed itself overseas as well, because I know what type of contact you guys used to have. What you do today, dog? What I, this is what I've done. This is how you... Did that relationship and understanding help you to, to go even further? You know, Bermuda, we talk, a, I know you're going to edit this. No, I'm not. But Bermuda, we talk a lot of smack. Nobody talks more smack than us. <laughs> so if I'm coming into a competition and I see Bellman in the lobby, I know what it's going to say. Hey, dog, hey, dog, dog, dog. And I see Nikki, and Nikki puts his head up like a true damn petition. I'm like, oh, my God. If you're not bringing your A game and those two guys, you might as well forget it, man. Forget it. Because they're going to – look, man. Them guys talk so much, Earl. I'm telling you, Earl. Earl, they talk smack. You think Velvet is a sweet guy. He's beautiful, a God-fearing man. But when he talks Mac, you better be ready. Okay? Let me tell you about Bellman. You probably never heard this story. That fool went out and told me when he took the world rock, when he took the world rock in Barcelona, that fool told me, rolled over in the middle of the night, don't. What? You sleep? No. I'm gonna take the world rocket tomorrow. I'm like, why are you telling me for? Because you got you, you, you gotta do something special. I'm like, well, man, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. I know, dog, but I'm, I thought I'd let you know. The next day, that fool took the damn world record. Okay? He comes back in the hotel room. Dog, but I got one. What you got? I'm like, I don't know, look, but Yeah, pain in my tail. Boy. But you have to. That, that's the smack you hear all day, you know? And he ain't going to let you sleep, you know? <laughs> he ain't going to let you sleep. He's sitting at the edge of the bed. Dog, like this. Dog, dog. And the worst thing Earl was, he took a world record and a gold medal. Mm. And the fool took the gold medal and he hung it over the lamp over the bed. And he said, dog. I said, what? What's that? I, that's a gold medal. You forgot one thing, dog. I said, what's that? Rock racket, rock racket, rock racket. <laughs> so come on, I have no other choice but to go out there and get a medal. Right, right. Yeah. And then it, I come back with my silver and it's like, dog. I said, what? Put your metal, put your metal, put your metal up. So 
said, all right, put my medal up, you know, and it's like, you see that dog? You see what my got dog? You see what my got dog? I said, all right, mama. But when you got teammates like that, if you can't go out there and produce, you might as well stay home, man. Stay home. And like I said, a guy like Brian Roman was, 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 guys like Brian and Nikki, they, they were the, the guys that kept you grounded because they're like every meeting at cop match and Connie game, all they do is talk smack. <laughs> all day. All day, man. You bet the breakfast table to talk smack to you. Lunch, you go to training. No. You have to produce. If that's why, if you look at all my national records, they always had a always had a major tournament. Why? I had Bauman one here. I had Nicky the other here. I had, man, I had nothing to but to put up, man. If I don't put up, then I might as well quit running. Yeah. But 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 you're talking about them. They would say the same thing about you. You don't stop talking either. Well, I'm from Double So. Come on, man. Cleveland <laughs> country. We don't stop talking, man. Come on. <laughs> No, we guys, I think this is something that Bermuda doesn't understand is we preach it into existence and uh, we, 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 we are a proud people and we represented the people uh, that made us who we are and we represented the 60,000 people of that 22 square mile, a mile and a half wide island. We love that island. We love our people. And we ain't going to let you down, you know. Uh, 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 I'm going to tell you, Dougie, 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 you know, Rangers, we attack, you know. You're blue and white like 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 Rangers, you know. And and Nick would be like, hey, look, Dougie, there's a coach, you know. It's like, oh, man, smack, 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 smack. But we're proud to be Bermudians. And we... We we actually we really 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 it was serious business for us to go out there and raise that flag, As, and 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 I never forget my first 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 tournament was in 1987 in Indianapolis, Indiana, and Lee Tucker was one of the team managers, and I I I, I I'm trying not to stop to 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 laugh, but that man was so proud to walk around with the Bermuda flag. It was amazing, Earl. I'm telling you, Earl. I've never seen a man so proud of the Bermuda flag as I saw Lee Tucker. He said, Dougie, it's about the flag. I'm like, what are you talking about, Lee? As all he talked about the open ceremony, it, it, it made you look at yourself differently. So, like I said, um, the village raised us. And uh, we were nurtured by the village. The village gave us everything that we needed to be who we are. And we're thankful for that. And uh, our, our thanks, thanks back to the village was, here, this is your gift. You, thank you. You, you raised us well. You know, that silver medal in Barcelona, here. Uh, that bronze medal that I won of the Netherlands in, in uh, Paris, it's Bermuda as well. Yeah, uh, that gold medal that I won as a national coach for the national team in uh, Finland in 2012. It's Bermuda as well. That fifth place that we got the national relay team in uh, London 2012. It's Bermuda as well. Uh, people in Bermuda don't realize, but every time my name is mentioned in the Netherlands, it always Troy Douglas from Bermuda. Yeah, so uh, uh, we are embraced in Bermuda, but we're also embraced in the Netherlands because of the achievements. So Bermuda should be proud of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, Mr. Douglas, I want to thank you for your time, uh, taking us back to when you started, to, to how, how you are today. I know uh, we could talk we could talk forever because you're now with Ajax doing a different job, um, but still coaching and, 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 and managing athletes' performances, which you know, it, it's something that I really want to get into because <laughs> from when you started that, we had that chat, initial chat, and I'm pretty sure what you've learned from yourself and through through the job over the period of time up to today, I'm pretty sure you have stories to tell uh, of what you've learned about yourself and of, of the program you've helped to develop. Yeah, the working at the, in football is, uh, you, you read about one thing, my experience as an 
athlete at a, a high level. I think when you probably heard it a lot. Um, they always say hire somebody that's performed at the highest level in your organization to help your organization win. And um, I, I didn't know the story until the guy that hired me actually told me why he hired me. And uh, this is the first time for Bermuda, so you got an exclusive. Um, Dennis Bearcomb told him, I need a guy to do this and this and this. And he's like, yeah, but now how do I find him? He says, that's your job. And so uh, my name came up. So he went back to Dennis Bearcomb, and Dennis Bearcomb said, hire him. Because he can do this and this and this. So I came, they hired me and uh, actually called me in for an interview. And I came home and I said to a friend of mine, I said, like, damn, I went in for an interview, but he said this and this and this and this. And the guy's like, oh, so you got the job. I was like, what? You got the job. Because anytime a future employee says that and that and that, they've already made their mind up about you. So uh, that first year, first half year, was really, really a challenging period for me because I had ideas in my head. But what you would realize, I had just left Bermuda and I came back here. And I was uh, uh, in, the, in the dressing room and I got to go to the training every day and I saw the training, I saw different things. And I must say, working in the football brought out a different talent in me that I didn't know I had. Um, and I know I give a lot of credit to my brother, Stephen, but we talk a lot. Um, uh, I talk a lot to Stephen. He's sort of, I, I, I think we're an extension of each other. Yes, we're brothers, but we have a unique relationship that we have an extension of each other. And I was telling him how I uh, do my job. And uh, he's like, yeah, but Troy, any, any smart coach can see that. And I was like, yeah, but how does he see? Troy, he hurt you and you hurt him. I'm like, oh, okay. And I went through my job like that. You know, um, uh, I would go to Dennis. I'm like, Dennis, uh, what do you want? Troy, he's not doing that, that, that. Oh, okay. So I would watch it and I'd tell the guy, why aren't you doing that, that, that? And I'm asking myself, why can't Dennis do that? But I didn't realize I have a way of bringing it over differently. I have a passion about it. Um, and I find something else in that. Yeah, it's like my nephew Chris told me, yeah, uncle, I want to get in shape. I said, but you're in shape. No, I'm not, uncle. I want to be faster. And so I said, okay, come up the track. I'll coach you. And he started asking me questions. I said, no, Chris, we're doing that. He said, why? And I said, because of that, that, that. It's like, oh, okay. And I didn't realize until talking to my nephew and then talk to my brother. My nephew would talk to his daddy. And my brother was Frenchy when Stephen would say, yeah, but Troy, because you walked him through it, and you explained it to him. And during the explanation, he actually, be, he not only believed you, he could feel it. You got him. And that's what I do. At, that's what I do at my job. And um, I understand speed. I see it. Um, I've discovered some things that uh, I've even started to change my language at my job. Um, they brought me in as a speed coach. And after two years there, I worked as a sports scientist heavily. And I told her, I said, listen, from now on, I'm going to stop using the word sprint speed because these guys don't sprint. They accelerate and decelerate. So I've also evolved over the years. Uh, my job as a performance coach in football is totally different. What Dennis Bearcomp was looking for was, uh, uh, because people don't know this, Dennis Bearcomp came out of track and field. The track club that I worked at at Amsterdam is Dennis Bearcomp's uh, track club. So a lot of guys that he ran with, I didn't know, they knew him. Mm. And uh, he's from the same school as Johan Cruyff is, and I'll go back to it, is what we do in Bermuda. And we think we're doing something wrong. We think we're not heavy enough. We do three sports. And we try to force a guy into doing one sport. No, let that kid make that decision. Okay? Um, 
I would rather a kid do three sports up until they're 17, and when they choose, they know what they're choosing for. Mm. Uh, I know a lot of people in track and field is going to get angry at me, but I don't care. Uh, I'm almost 60, so shoot me. Uh, I told my brother this when I was back at home. I said, do you know what the most successful uh, sport is we have in Bermuda? It's cricket. And I'll tell you why. I could still play it at 40. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? How long did that guy, um, uh, what do you name? Mr. Gennaro Tucker, how long you play cup match? Oh, into his 40s. Thank you. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And uh, we're good at that. And he played football in the offseason to stay in shape to play cricket. Am I right or wrong? Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah? yeah. So uh, we, we take that for granted. Um, uh, we really, really have to realize we have a good system in place. <laughs> Uh, the only thing we should do is stop trying to make a person into a one sport athlete. If you look at why do you think we're so good at triathlon? Three disciplines. Thank you. You three understand what I'm sports. saying? It's three different sports. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, you can't tell me that in Ireland we're, we're good at triathletes and we've got all these guys playing cop match in North season to run a kick in football. Yeah. What's that pioneer that played for Cleveland? He plays for Rangers now, that, that opening batsman. Who, Curtis Jackson? No, the other one. Jesus. He played, he, he played for Cleveland, then he went down there and played for St. David's. Oh, Dion Stowe. Another one. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, look at my nephew, Alan. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Exact same thing. Yeah, he would play cricket all summer and play football. Yeah, and come back and play cricket, play football. But 99% of those guys that play cricket, their passion is cricket. Mm. Yeah, but don't try to make them play cricket all year round, let them play football in between. Yeah, because it's a different training, it's a different side of your brain that they're using, it's a different nervous system than what they're doing in cricket. And as a performance coach, I'm glad that I have athletes that do that. But what's stopping me in, uh, uh, in my job here now is, excuse me, we specialize too quickly. And that's what I'm seeing at my job now. Um, but yeah, I'm at a professional club, it's different. Uh, I have guys that uh, just turned 19 today and they're about to sign their second professional contract. <laughs> and what they sign their second professional contract for is, is, is you can buy a house in Bermuda. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And these are 19 year olds. Mm. And uh, yeah, I'm working with the most, I, did, I heard this this week, yesterday in training, uh, one of the, the, the coaches said, this is the best talent group that we have since Matthijs and Frankie and uh, Nori and Donny van der Beek. Wow. That says a lot for a, 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 a big club such as that. Yeah. And I, I look... And I'm, I'm sorry I said it that way, but... Because I'm, I, I, do, I do not see football the way they see football. I look at the, the athleticism. I'm, I'm a freak for athleticism. And all I see is what they do athletic-wise. And uh, I love working with the team that I work with because I have football coaches who are so damn good that when they explain something to me and I watch it, I'm like, oh, yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I'm glad that I'm able to stay that way my whole career is to keep that innocence. I don't know it. I, I'm still learning and, I, and to be honest, Earl, I don't want to know football. Mm. I just want to know uh, what do you want from me, and I can, I can fix that for you. Uh, if you explain to me what I fixed and why I fixed it, and I can see it, I'm going to go home, have a beer and a cigar, and watch a football game. That's all I'm going to do. Yeah? My, my, a couple of friends have been here to visit me. 
And I'm like, Dougie, you don't go to games? He says, no. Dougie, you got Champions League tickets and you don't go? Says, no. Why? I don't feel like it. I see these guys every damn day. I know what they're gonna play. I know what they're gonna do at that game. So I'd rather go home, have a nice cold beer and a cigar, and watch the game on my TV. I'm more relaxed because I got to be back at the club at damn like eight o'clock the next day. So I'm not gonna sit in the stadium and watch a damn game. Right. You know. Right. So I don't. I don't feel like that. Right. So, but I get my tickets away most of the time. So any Bermudian who's coming to Amsterdam, give me a call and I get a ticket to the Champions League. Don't worry about it. Well, again, I want to thank yeah. you, and I do want to tell you the next time I see Dennis Watson Jr. on the seven, thank you very much. Because had he had not dropped you, you probably wouldn't have been a track star. No, Dennis Wainwright Jr. Dennis Wainwright Jr. I'm sorry, Dennis Wainwright Jr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He, he, he didn't. He didn't pick his ace boy, his <laughs> next door neighbor, his boy. You know, was you a boy to the day after day? To Devonshire know? to the track. <laughs> He said, Dougie, go up there and train for track and field, but you can't run. You can't play cricket, but you can't even catch a f-ing ball. But. <laughs> well, hey, thanks a lot. I'll talk to you soon. No worries. Appreciate All right. You. Thanks, Earl. Appreciate it. All righty. Folks, that's it for right. Remembering When with Troy Douglas. Oh, 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 oh,